Everybody, so happy you guys are here. Good morning, everyone. So happy that you guys are with us this morning. Let's stand and worship together. saying about it. Do you believe it? Yeah. All right. Well, happy Chapel Day. Great to see you. Thank you for being here this morning. I have just two quick announcements. Number one, Wednesday night, we have a big basketball game here in the arena. It is Electrolope. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. 
Wednesday night. We'd love for you to be here for that. I think you'll have a great time. Hey, next Monday morning, we have a special speaker. First time that he'll be with us. His name is Marcus Doe. Marcus uh, is the founder and CEO of We Reconcile. I heard him uh, several months ago. He has got an amazing story. He's a refugee from Liberia. He was orphaned at 11 years old. An unbelievable story. That's next Monday in chapel, so you won't want to miss that. Uh, Today, though, our speaker is Ashley Woolridge from CCV. So, Ashley, thank you for being here. He has his wife, Jamie, and some of their staff and some of their kids. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but uh, future, well, I won't go that far either. But uh, we're glad you're here. Have a great time on campus. There's not a student in this place that won't buy you lunch today if you just look at them in the right way, right? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, you got extra swipes, right? Are you already, have you already used up your money? It's only February. I'm crying out loud. Yes? All right. Well, looks like we need to pass the plate this morning. Sorry about that. All right. We want to get back to singing. I want to read a scripture for you from Psalm 100, it says this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen? Amen.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good. You're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, and let the king of my heart
thousand psalms to captivate your heart, but more than offerings. Lord, you seek the depths of me when you
God, thank you for being such a good, good father. Lord, that you stand with open arms, God, waiting for us to run to you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. God, that you have never taken your eyes off of us, Lord. We love you. We pray that you would be with us through this week. Open our hearts and our ears to receive the message, God. And we just thank you that you are continuously walking with us day in and day out. So we love you, God. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's in your name that we pray. Hey, I don't, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I just, I'm just gonna say it because I just felt like God's speaking it during that song that someone needs to hear today that God really does see you. Like he sees you right where you're at. In, in spite of all your mistakes, in spite of all your failures, and he loves you beyond what you could ever, ever imagine. Just, just like receive that, receive it today, okay? You know who else loves you? This school loves you. Um, our church loves you. Okay, I pastor a church called CCV and we love GCU, all right? In fact, we've wanted to um, open a campus near GCU for so long and we've looked and uh, nothing's opened up, but something finally did. So February 26th, that became a reality. And so February, the weekend of February 26th, that Sunday, we're gonna open a campus that is right across the street from you uh, at GCU. So on the, the corner, okay, it's on the corner of 35th Avenue and Montebello. It was a church called Maryville Baptist Church and they kind of gotten down to about 15 people. So they gave us um, their church because they wanted to reach students. They wanted to reach the community. And so we're gonna open up on that weekend. I did the math before I came here. From your Taco Bell on campus to that uh, campus is, on, is about a thousand steps, okay? So you have no excuse. If you don't have a church home, you have no excuse. And uh, we'd love to invite you there if, if you wanna come be a part of that. It's gonna be a lot, lot of fun, okay? Um, so <clears throat> when I went to college, my sophomore year of college, is when I met my wife, Jamie. She's on the front row uh, here. And uh, so, yeah, you can give her a hand. I mean, why not? She might, you know, I, so I, I, met my, I met my wife, Jamie, in my sophomore year of college. And what she likes to say, this is her words, not mine. She likes to say, before Ashley met me, he was a player. He was a player. Now, I wholeheartedly disagree. But when I was preparing for this message, I actually called her on the phone. I was on speakerphone. I said, hey, would, would you still say that about me that I'm a player? She goes, absolutely, I would still say that. And my daughter's in the background. She says, you were, dad, you were a player. I was like, you weren't even there. What are you talking about, you know? So it's not like I dated, you know, like a hundred girls before I met my wife, Jamie, but she does have one story that she likes to hold over my head. And I thought I'd tell it to you today to start our time together. Okay, what? The story she had is when, when she met me, my sophomore year of college, I was trying to talk to and see and kind of try to date two girls at the same time. Dude, I feel judged already. I feel, your, I feel your judgment. Now, I was pretty young, pretty dumb at the time, but, but, but what happened was there was a blonde, there was a brunette, and I couldn't make up my mind, all right? And I was, I, I, I was, I was like, I was wavering, all right? I, I just, I was wavering between these two things. So uh, what happened was, okay, there, on one side, there's the brunette, all right? This brunette played on our college uh, volleyball team, on the female team. I played on the men's volleyball team, went to school on a scholarship. And so I thought that was kind of cool that we were that. And plus, she was kind of this famous childhood actress. Uh, she played... Um, one of the daughters on the show, Little House on the Prairie, if anybody remembers Little House on the Prairie. And so I was like, she was on Little House on the Prairie. Like, that's kind of cool. So that's, that's the brunette, all right? Then there was the blonde. She was beautiful. I mean, she had these like brown eyes that just captivated you, kind of drew you in. She played on our college's uh, uh, soccer team. She was on the women's soccer team. I thought that was neat but I found myself wavering. Now, my roommates picked up on it and they were smart enough to say, what are you doing? 
you can't try to see and try to date two girls at the same time. You're gonna mess it all up. And they were right, because when the blonde found out I was talking to the brunette, she came to me and in so many words she said, you're either all in with me or I'm all out, buddy. All out, right? So, so I, I was, so I was in this position, I was like, okay, I have to stop wavering. And I had to make a decision. I made a decision. Thankfully, I made the right decision because that blonde is now my wife. Here's a picture, right? A blonde's now my wife. Those are our, those are our three daughters. I got a son-in-law now and she's on the front row with two, two of my beautiful girls. And so I made the right decision. But listen, listen. I almost ruined it all because I was wavering. Now today, what a lot of you are struggling with, wavering with is, is not, uh, I hope it's not two guys, I hope it's not two girls, okay? Like, like me, I was dumb. Um, what many of you are wavering with today is you're wavering in your relationship with God. And it's not even that you would say you don't believe in God anymore, but what has happened is that God is way down here and you have a bunch of things that are way up here and you're wavering. Now, it's, it's not an accident that I'm probably here on your integrity week, all right? Uh, Tim told me it's integrity week and you need to know something about God and when it comes to your integrity with your relationship with God, did you know God demands first place in your life? He actually can't accept any other place in your life. Why? Because he is first, he is best. He has to have first place in your life. And that's something you really need to let sink into your heart that God has to be number one. In fact, what is the first of the 10 commandments? In fact, the, the most important of the 10 commandments, Exodus 23 says, you must not have any other gods before me, little g, any other idols, any other things you put above God. And then Jesus, when he hits the scene in the New Testament, Jesus was asked once, what's the most important commandment? Remember how Jesus answered? He started this way, Matthew 22. He said, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Let nothing, nothing take first place in your life besides God. So what I wanna do today is I just wanna take you to a very prophetic passage of scripture that was just, it was prophetic back then, and it's gonna be just as prophetic today. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you wanna turn there. And what's happened is this is the story of the prophet Elijah. And what, what, what was happening in Elijah's day is much of what's like happening in our day. The people of God, it's not that they'd stopped believing in God, it's that they'd started putting a bunch of idols above God. And so God, God raises up a prophet, Elijah. He sends Elijah to the people and here's the message Elijah's gonna give the people, which is the same message God's gonna give some of us today. It's time to stop wavering. Now, what was happening in Elijah's day was um, a king named Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, they had introduced all these idols into, into Israel and the people of God. And the idols they introduced were primarily um, these false gods, Baal and Asherah. Now you can still go to Israel, the Israel Museum today, a massive museum, I've been there myself, these are some of my pictures. You can still go see the actual idols they were worshiping. You can see the clay and gold and silver tablets. Here's some pictures of, um, flip back one, you can pick, see some pictures of Asherah, which is this one. This is, these are the gods Asherah. Asherah was typically depicted as this woman that was naked. She had very large um, breasts normally in her pictures because she was the god of sex and fertility. And Asherah taught you should just sleep with anyone, whoever you want. In fact, they had temple prostitutes in the temple where you would sleep with like a prophetess of Asherah when you actually went to church. That's how bad it got. Now, they also were worshiping the gods of Baal. Now, Baal was typically depicted as a bull. And here's some pictures of Baal. And Baal was the god of a lot of things, but primarily he's the god of the sky and the rain because in their culture, it was an agricultural culture. So their money, their income came from just growing crops or if there was enough you know, rain to, 
to have grass to feed the herds. And so people were turning to Baal for their economic prosperity, all right? Now you look at those photos and if you're like me, you're like, <laughs> like how primitive and stupid do you have to be to like worship an idol like that? But aren't we kind of doing the same thing today? Like we, we may not worship, you know, Baal, but how many of us worship the God of money and success? Hey, some of you chose a major simply because of what you thought it could do for you economically. And we, we may not worship Asherah today, but you're telling me today, in, in today's day and age, we don't worship the gods of sex and sexuality? I mean, sex has become like the end all be all for so many people today. In fact, there's some people, they define their identity based on their sexuality. You tell me that's not putting something above God, your sexuality? So what, what we have today is we have the same idols and the same issues. And what you need to know is, is sex and money, they're not bad things. They, they're given to us by God. And in idols, idols sometimes aren't bad things. You know, an idol is often a good thing you put in God's place. Anything that you put in God's place can become a bad thing, even if it's a good thing. So what is an idol? If you're taking notes today, an idol is simply anything, anything you value more than God. Let me put it this way. An idol is anything you seek to give you what only God can. And you know what? Our human hearts are idol factories. Let me make it personal. My heart is an idol factory. There's so many times that I know I've put something above God. I'll, I'll just be transparent today. There's times, and think about good things we put in God's place. There's times I put my role as a pastor at our church CCV over even my relationship with God. That I start to be concerned about how am I being viewed? Like how, like this, this role I have versus just resting in the identity of what we sang about even in that last song that God sees us. We're, we're a child of God. He loves us for who we are, not what we do. See, you, you have an enemy, Satan, that will do everything to get you to put anything above God. He wants you to chase after an idol and he's after you. And he will keep throwing stuff your way until he finds something that sticks. And so in Elijah's day, God sends Elijah to be a prophet. And listen, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a prophet, but today I think God has a prophetic word for us today. And here it is, it's time to stop wavering. It's time to stop wavering. Let's pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Um, Elijah goes to King Ahab and we'll pick up, let's pick up in verse 19, it says this. Elijah says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So he's like, bring all the people that are promoting all the idols, bring them all to Mount Carmel. And he says this, so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and he assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Now just picture this in your mind for a second. It's one Elijah versus 450 prophets of Baal, which is pretty bad odds, right? I mean, that would be like your GCU basketball team going against like the sixth grade elementary school down the street. Like you're gonna get slaughtered. But Elijah knew something that we need to understand, which is one with God is always a majority. One person sold out to God is always a majority. And so Elijah is gonna go up against these 450 prophets of Baal. And here's what he says, verse 21. <clears throat> Elijah went before the people and he said, I want you to say out loud what's in yellow. How long will you say it out loud? Waver. Say it, say it louder. How long will you what? Waver. Hey, how long are you gonna waver between two different opinions? How long are you gonna waver between God and something else? Now I love this word waver because in the Hebrew language, the word, the word waver means to limp along. It means to shake, it means to be, it's, it's where we get the English idiom to ride the fence. Hey, how long are you gonna ride the fence? In fact, did you know in American Sign Language, I looked this up, this term of like wavering, 
Here's, here's how you sign it. You sign it this way. To ride the fence, to shake, to waver. How many of you know that when you ride the fence, all you end up with is a splintered life? And the reason some of you feel so, um, the reason some of you feel so out of balance right now, the reason some of you struggle so much with your mental health, the reason that you feel so unstable is because you've been wavering. And anytime you waver, you get out of balance because God's designed, your life is designed to run off of God as the fuel that fuels you, not something else. So Elijah says, how long are you gonna waver? And I love what he says next. He says this, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now, don't miss what, what Elijah's saying. The word follow him in, in the Hebrew means to like die to something, to go all in. So here's what Elijah's saying, just picture this. Elijah says, if God is God, go all in, but if there's something else like a Baal or another God that can fulfill your life, just go all in with that. You know how disingenuous it is for you to go, Jesus, thank you for saving my life. Thank you for the ticket to heaven. Now I'm gonna do whatever I want on earth. So Elijah says, just, just pick one. And whatever you pick, just go all in with it. Can I contextualize that for us? Like if, if your God today is money, like you think money is gonna be the thing that's gonna fulfill you or having more stuff, here's what I would say. Elijah would say this, go all in. Like spend and spend and just spend all your time shopping till you drop, go into debt up to your eyeballs. Like don't mess with, don't have a, don't even think about finances, just go all in. Hey, if image is your God, if that can satisfy what you look like and how people view you, then go all in. The only thing that should matter to you is you going to the gym, working out, losing weight, looking great, and having a really good camera that can take pictures so you can filter those suckers and put them on social media and get a bunch of likes. I'm not joking, that's all that should matter to you. Just sell out. Sell out to it. Don't like kinda halfway be like, God, I love you, but, but my image is, is everything too. You're wavering. And by the way, if you need to tuck it or trim it or curl it or tan it, like do it. Do it all. Just sell out. How about this? If sex is the thing that can satisfy you, go all in. Like forget what God says. Forget what God says. You should sleep with everybody. Anytime you want. I mean, it's your body. It's your body. You can do what you want with it, right? Like, forget what God says. He actually said it's not your body, but you, I mean, you just sell out. Do it. Sleep with whoever, whenever, however. And if you're not married, don't get married because then you sleep with everybody. And if you are married here today, like, don't let a little thing like a marriage vow get in the way of you having some fun on the side. And forget the STD, I mean, don't worry about the STDs. Don't worry about the guilt. Hey, don't worry, don't worry about that your marriage someday will fall apart and you'll leave your kids like a parent left you. If, it's, if, you, if that's your God, here's what Elijah's saying. He's just saying, sell out, like sell out to it. But if God is God, you better stop wavering. You better go all in, all in. Come on, GCU, like all in with God. That's what he's saying. Now, hey, Elijah's just saying, just choose. I like how Charles Spurgeon put it. He said, if you're gonna be saved, like be saved all the way. So uh, Elijah's words were piercing back then. I sense probably Elijah's words are piercing someone here today. Cause you, you know you're wavering. So Elijah says, stop wavering. You know what the people's response was? Verse 21, the people said nothing. They couldn't respond, why? Cause they had one foot in and one foot out with God. They were wavering. So what Elijah does next is he gets all 450 prophets of Baal. He says this, he says, get two bulls. 
get two bulls and we're gonna put some wood on an altar. You put uh, your bull on your altar. I'll put my bull on my altar. And then verse 20 says, verse 24, you call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now this is a cool imagery because in that day and age, a bull represented all success, all prosperity. And by the way, it kind of still does today. Like for example, when the economy's humming and everything's going good in the stock market, we call it a what kind of market? A, it's a bull market, so we call it. So Elijah says, you take everything you think that can give you prosperity and happiness and blessing, you put it on your altar, I'll put my bull on my altar, and the God who lights it up with fire, the God who lights it up, lights it up, that's the real God. And you know what the prophets of Baal say? Let's do it. Now that's one of the saddest parts of the story to me because they actually believed, that means they believed their gods could light up people's lives. They actually believed it. So Elijah's polite. He says, uh, you guys go first. Like, you, you got all this stuff, sex and money and power. Like, you guys go first. So what happened was, at, at, it says at noon, Elisha, or it says that in verse 26, then they called on the name of Baal till morning till noon. Think about that. All the way from morning until noon, they called on Baal. They shouted at him. They said, Baal, answer us. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they made. And what happens next cracks me up. Elijah starts smack talking them. Now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty competitive. So sometimes I like to smack talk like playing sports. And I thought, you know what? This, this gives me permission because a man of God starts smack talking. Maybe it's appropriate on occasion. I don't know, you know? But Elijah really starts smack talking and it's bad. He, he says to them, because there's no one's answering. Their gods are not answering them. So he says, well, just shout like, he says, I don't know, just just shout louder, he says. I mean, surely they're a God. Surely he's a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. And he's like, maybe he's like sleeping night night. Just wake him up, you know? This is pretty funny. You can ask your, your Bible professors this. When Elijah says maybe he's busy, that word translated busy, they translated it in the, in the NIV version and other versions really nicely. The word busy in the Hebrew literally means he's probably in the bathroom stopped up. He's constipated. If you yell louder, he can push harder. Like this is literally what the, what, that's literally what the word means. It means Elijah is talking some serious smack to these guys. So you wanna know what happens next? Elijah talks smack to him in verse 28. It says, so they did shout louder. And then it says this, then they began to slash themselves. They began to actually cut themselves, which was their custom, and blood began to ran, run out of the cuts where they were cutting themselves. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until it was evening sacrifice and there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. Now I just want someone to lean in for a second because this is the, this is the heartbreaking part of the story to me because what, what we see here is that when you turn to another God besides God to, to fulfill you, they begin slashing themselves, you will begin hurting yourself. My experience as a pastor is anytime someone turns to something else to fulfill them besides God, they begin hurting themselves. They begin hurting themselves. I've seen girls that, that are so numb, they actually physically cut themselves just so they can feel something again. We see people have eating disorders. There's people that are doing some really, really harmful things to yourself sexually. You're hurting yourself. Some of you are just, you, your, your mental health, you just keep struggling and you're hurting yourself. Anytime you turn to a God that says the one true God, you will begin to hurt yourself. And that's what we see in this story. And so finally, Elisha's going to show them there's only one God that can deliver. Verse 36, at the time of the sacrifice, Elijah stepped forward. Think about this. The prophets of Baal have been going from morning and it's evening now, trying to call out to their God. No response. Elijah steps forward at the e at evening time and he does this. You know what Elijah does? He doesn't dance. He doesn't shout. What's it say Elijah did? He prayed. 
Now, I love that because you know what God doesn't need from you? He doesn't need your theatrics. He doesn't need your dancing. He needs a heart devoted and sold out to him. So Elijah just simply prays to God. He prays a, a devoted prayer to God. He says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac of Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. You are the only God. Verse 37, answer me, Lord, answer these people so these people will know that you are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and the stones and the wood and the soil and also licked up the water around the trench because Elijah had poured water on just to prove to them how great God is. And when all the people saw this, they fell down prostrate before God. And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And the people knew they had to choose God. Now, when I read that story and I see God bringing fire down from heaven to wake people up, to show him that he is the one true God, here's, here's what goes through my mind. God, why wouldn't you just do that today? Like right in chapel right now, God, just bring like a massive fireball on the stage and like everyone would know. I don't know if last time you've been around fire, but is it an understatement to say fire is pretty hot? Like you would feel it, you would know it. And I was, as I was thinking of that, reading this story, God just convicted my heart in like the biggest way because he, because he said this, I've done something bigger than that. God sent his son Jesus, his only son in human form, to show you who he is. And Jesus died for you on a cross and he rose again three days later. That's bigger than any fireball God could ever send on this earth. To get a hold of your heart, to show you who he is. When I was a kid, um, I, I played with fire a lot. Anybody else play with, you know, like a pyrotechnic? I played with fire all the time, man. I lit a field on fire, the fire department had to come. My parents were like, did you do that? And I was like, my sister did. Then uh, I lit another field on fire and I was like, I don't wanna call the fire department. I, I got in trouble last time. So I tried to stomp it out and the fire burned all the hair off my legs and burnt my legs. You, you remember how, how hot fire is? Like fire represents something. When Jesus came to this earth and he showed you who God is, and he showed you how much he loves you by dying for you, when Jesus left this earth, what did he give you as a gift that lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus? What did he give you? The Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit represented by? What's the symbol? It's fire. You remember in Acts chapter two? The Holy Spirit descended on them and it was like tongues of fire over them. And I just want someone here to, here to know this. God wants to light up your life. But it takes you making a decision, like no more wavering. And this is a time in your life where in college, so many people waver. You start experimenting with other things and you get a little bit of freedom and, and you, you start doing something else and God starts getting a back seat and you wonder, why does life feel so out of balance? Why am I struggling? It's because you're wavering. And I just think God brought me today, and I don't know who you are, he brought me to just tell you the way Elijah told people over 3,000 years ago, it's time to stop wavering. You gotta make a choice. You gotta make a choice. So what I wanna do is I wanna ask every head here to just, just bow your head, close your eyes, don't, like, don't escape the moment without letting God speak to you today. Every head bowed, every, every eye closed. Let me just ask you a question. Is there anything in your life, even a good thing that you put in God's place? Is, it, is there something that you know is more important to you than God? Is there something that you know is a bad thing 
I mean, it's, it's so obvious, but you continue to engage it. Is, is pornography continuing to plague you? And you're, you're not even asking for help. Is there a dependence on alcohol or a drug that you keep turning to when you feel empty or alone? You keep thinking that's gonna light up your life. Is, is there something you're engaging in sexually that you just know is wrong? Hey, it could be a good thing. For some of you, is it a relationship? It's not bad, it's just taking God's place. Is it, is it a sport? Is it, is it your likes on social media? Is it your image? Is it what you look like? Is it your pursuit of money? The question God has for all of us today is, is where are you wavering? So just get that in your mind. And then here's the question. What would it look like to put God first? Some of you need to remove something, remove something off your phone to ask someone for help. Some of you just need to make God the first part of every day. Like why not just get into God's word and let him start renewing your mind every day. Some of you don't attend a church. Like, and you, you, know, you put a good thing in God's place. You're, you're studying all the time. You have all your excuses why you're not engaged in the body of Christ. It's time to stop and put God first. Like every weekend, you're like, I gotta be in God's, like I gotta be in God's presence with, with his people. Some of you, you've never even given your life to Jesus. It'd just be time to get baptized. Say, God, I, I gotta stop wavering. I don't know what God's telling you. I'm just here to say this. It's time to make a choice. Because if you don't make a choice, you will ruin your life. And I don't want that for you. And there's a heavenly father that loves you way too much to not want you to go all in with him. So I'm gonna pray right now that for whatever God's telling you to do to stop wavering, you'd have the courage to do it. We pray. Father, I thank you for just the words of Elijah. They're so relevant today as they were so many thousands of years ago. And I know how much I waver at, at times, God, in my own faith. I begin to put something above you. And yet, God, would you remind us that it's not until we put you on the throne of our life will our life ever be blessed, peaceful, happy. Help a student here today, even a faculty member, anyone here that's listening, help them to make a decision today to stop wavering and this would be a defining moment where they go after you and put you first. In Jesus' name, and all of us said, amen. Hey, GCU, be blessed. Have a great week. Thanks for letting me come be with you.